Hi, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Um, welcome to this webinar. This is your coronavirus checklist and estate planning guide. And I'm Jay Marie Schaefer, and I'm a partner at the Herzog Law Firm. And our law firm specializes in estate planning and elder law. And uh, we normally do live seminars, but we have been doing these webinars um, as a way to continue getting information out to everyone. And I thought this would be an interesting one for people uh, uh, to put together a checklist of things that uh, you should do in an emergency. Um, so before we get started, just some housekeeping. Uh, you have a, a chat button uh, available to you and that's how we can take questions. So if you can type in your questions, I can answer them either as we go along or if we don't get to do that, I will answer them at the end. Okay, let's get started. So first of all, we're going to talk about why you need a checklist. And here's an example I came up with. Um, and it's, it could be a, a common example. Um, you get a call from your mother in Florida that she's going to the hospital um, because of COVID. It could be COVID. It could be at any other time, any other emergency. And so you think to yourself, do I have a healthcare proxy so I can talk to her doctors? Um, do I know her bank accounts and bills? Do I have um, the ability to pay for them while she's in the hospital? And at a time like this, you realize you may not have the answers. Um, you may not even have the documents in place. So we're kind of go through a checklist of what you need to have in place um, to prepare you for a, a crisis or an emergency like this. So here's a checklist of different things that uh, you should think about. So first is, do you have a plan in place uh, for your care or your loved ones during the time of a crisis? And we're going to talk about what types of plan, uh, what elements of the plan that you need to have. Um, next is, who is going to be making decisions for you? Normally you would think, okay, my, my family has the ability to make decisions for me. But there are some things that your family can't do for you without having certain documents or legal papers in place. And if you don't um, put in writing who you want to make decisions, maybe the family member that you don't want uh, to make decisions is going to be making decisions for you. So if you can pick who you want in advance, that's going to be great. Uh, the next thing to think about is who is going to manage your finances. You know, do you have your bills set up on auto pay or does someone still need to go in and pay the bills every month? Um, does someone need to deposit checks for you? Is, or is all of your income direct deposited? Um, who's going to make sure all that runs uh, during a time where you're in the hospital or, or not able to do these things? Next is who is going to make healthcare decisions for you? Interestingly, we often find that the person who is going to do the finances is not always the same person who would uh, do the healthcare decisions. You know, sometimes it's obvious in a family, you may have one person who's in a particular field who could do one thing or another. You know, maybe someone's a little bit better with healthcare and medicine and someone else is better at finance. So those are considerations you think you should think about as to who can do what role for you. The next one that's very important is, do you have a list of your important information for your family? And I'm really gonna recommend throughout this uh, presentation today is that you put together a list. And this list is going to have a lot of different things in it. I mean, first you should have a list of, you know, all your financial accounts, your retirement plans, your health insurance. It could have, a, it should have a list of your doctors and medications and other important things that we're going to talk about. Um, so many times I talk to families in a crisis and they just ask me, they say, well, I don't really know you know, what my parent had, or, and I, I need to figure out how to do it. Um, so if you can go ahead and do that list in advance, that's gonna be so much easier for them. And the last thing to think about is, can your family access your documents? Um, sometimes, but not often, people do create um, wills, healthcare proxies, or powers of attorney, but they don't tell their family about them. Or they don't give them copies. So if it is a situation where you need to get the copies, how are you going to get them? And just for an example of that, I think it was about two or three weeks ago, it was a Sunday. 
And I get my emails on my phone, so I happened to check my emails on Sunday. And it was a client who was emailing me. She said my father-in-law um, got sent to the hospital, and um, she was in another state. And she's like, I don't have a copy of his healthcare proxy. Can you get it to me? Well, I mean, luckily for her, I had checked it on the weekend. So I was able to go into our um, computer from home and get that healthcare proxy that she needed and email it to her. Um, if I hadn't checked it or if I wasn't able to do that, it would have had to wait till Monday morning. So you want to find a way that your family can access your documents because, you know, you, they need to have them in the time of an emergency. So do you have a plan in place? And this is very important. Um, just kind of practical stuff. Um, who are your emergency contacts? You know, if you were home alone and something happened to you, how would people know who to contact? I know that you can put contacts on your phone. Um, so there's a way that, uh, you know, emergency personnel could look at your phone and determine who your contacts are. If you don't or have that, you could put a list in your house, generally on your refrigerator is you know, the best place to look for a list like that. Um, so think about where that information could be found so people can contact uh, your family members. Next uh, thing that's important, if you do live alone and uh, you're you know, a little bit older, you have, or you're getting a little bit, um, you have some health conditions, you should have daily check-ins to make sure that you're okay. Uh, so is someone calling you every day? Is someone stopping by? Um, are you going out somewhere so that if you miss a visit somewhere, someone would know and that, they, that you could be checked upon? Next one is if you have health issues, do you have a medical alert? Um, so this is, of course, the button that you press, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up. And, you know, we joke about it, but it does really help in an emergency. I have found that it's kind of half and half about whether people really want to wear that or not. Um, so if you do have an elderly relative, it's really important to try and get them to wear that and, and wear it, not just have it in the house on the table, because that's not going to be accessible to you in an emergency. Um, it really needs to be something that you wear so you can use. And the last one is, do you have a list of your medications and a list of your doctors? And this is important if you have many illnesses or you take lots of medications. Um, as you get older, you may not remember all the medications and the doses. So it's important to have it written down. So for yourself, when you talk to doctors, um, but we're talking about times of crisis. Um, so if you were brought to the hospital and your family member found this or they had this, they could show it to the doctors at the hospital and say, this is what this person normally takes. So these are some really um, just simple, basic things that you can get done, um, easy to implement, and they're really gonna help you a lot. So next, we're gonna talk, so next thing to talk about is who will make decisions for you. Is it gonna be your spouse, your children, your family members? Are there some things that you may want a professional to decide for you? your lawyer or your accountant or your financial advisor? Um, and, and do they have the authority to make decisions for you? That's going to be the, um, the important piece. So what we're going to talk about next in relation to that is advanced directives. And an advanced directive is a document that gives someone else legal authority to make decisions for you when you are incapacitated. And the warning here is don't put off incapacity planning because you know you th think right now I'm fine I don't need to do this something can happen and then it's too late for you to do that so you need to do it while you're well in advance and I you know so many times I, I have um, two or three cases I'm working on right now where someone did not have a power of attorney or a healthcare proxy and they're now one, you know, in the hospital, someone's in a rehabilitation center, and we're really faced with having to do a guardianship in the courts, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but that's something you want to avoid. And it's really easy to 
avoid that by doing these documents in advance. So a power of attorney. So the power of attorney is the main document uh, that you're going to use to have someone manage your financial and legal affairs for you. And as I said, if you don't have a power of attorney, you have to go to court. Uh, so the power of attorney, you know, lets you pay bills, lets you handle real estate insurance. It lets you handle um, gift making. There is a separate piece of the power of attorney that lets you make gifts. It lets you set up trusts. It lets you do Medicaid planning. So there is a lot of power um, that you are giving to the agent in the power of attorney. And it's important that they have all those powers. So it's also important that you think about who is the best person to do that. In the power of attorney, you can appoint one person or you could appoint two people to act together. We always suggest that you have backup individuals in case the first person that you appoint is not available. Uh, a power of attorney to be valid has to be notarized. And then for the gifting part, it has to be witnessed by two people. So it's important to get that done properly. It's also a, a very um, lengthy, complicated document. It's about 14 pages long. There's lots of things to initial and things to think about different powers as you go through it. So it's always best to go through this with an elder law or estate planning attorney. Uh, you can get the form yourself online, um, but as you'll, we've talked about before with wills or with other documents, when you get it online yourself, there is a great risk of making mistakes. Um, and then you may not have it um, done properly when you do need it later on. The next document uh, to talk about is a healthcare proxy. So of course, a healthcare proxy is what is going to allow your agent to make medical decisions for you. So, you know, similar to the power of attorney, just in the you know, realm of health decisions, one big difference between the healthcare proxy and the power of attorney is that your healthcare proxy can only name one person at a time to act. So on your power of attorney, maybe you had, you know, both of your children acting. On the healthcare proxy, you can put them both on there, but they're gonna have to be listed in order. You'd have to have you know, one person first and then the second person as an alternate after that person. And the reason that's done is because in a situation where uh, a medical decision has to be made, um, the hospitals and the doctors want one person to be the spokesperson for the family at a time. Uh, they don't want to have the possibility of two people with differing views. Um, so you do have to decide who you want to be that person. And, you know, commonly it is your spouse and then your children, um, but many, not many, but frequently I see it not uh, be those individuals. Um, you're really going to pick someone who thinks the same way you do or understands what your wishes are in regards to health care. So, you know, it doesn't have to be the close relative. It could be another friend or family member that you think is going to be able to do the job for you. Um, so that's really important that you think it's the person who's best suited for the job, not necessarily, you know, your kids um, in oldest order down to youngest order. That may not be the best way to do that. In addition to a healthcare proxy, you should have a living will or a most form. Um, so a living will is going to be a document that says what your wishes are for end of life care. And it has to be, it's a document, it's in writing. Uh, generally, you'll see it as the language saying, if I'm in an irreversible condition and there's no hope of survival, then I would not want um, artificial nutrition or hydration. Um, and that's kind of the basics is variations on that. And it's important to have that in writing because if you were um, in that situation and there was a discussion about whether to remove life support or not. By having this in writing, this is evidence to the doctors that this is what your wishes are. And then this is very important in that discussion with the doctors and your family as to what to do for you. Another form that's similar, it's called a MOLST form. 
and that's medical orders for life-sustaining treatment. And this is generally for people who have, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, serious health condition and they meet with their doctor. This is a form that is signed by yourself and by the doctor. And then you go through all different types of questions. And, and these are some of them, you know, do you want to do not resuscitate? Do you want to DNI, do not intubate? You know, do you want nutrition and hydration? Would you want painkillers? Um, would you want antibiotics, even if they, you know, prolong your life, but you're not, you know, your quality of life is not good. So this is a, a it's a pink form, a hot pink form. It's a couple pages long, and it's a really great thing to do to sit down and go through with your doctor, get all this sorted out ahead of time, you sign it, your doctor signs it, and now that's um, something in your medical records uh, that can be followed. I am just uh, talking, let's see, about, okay. So these forms are, the question was, are these advanced directives? So all of these forms are advanced directives. Um, the power of attorney, the healthcare proxy, and the living will, um, because they're all saying what you would want done when you're not able to make decisions for yourself. So all of these are what I consider the advanced directives. And so these two or three forms are, the, are really important to have. Um, I say two or three because the living will can be a separate document or the living will language can be incorporated into your healthcare proxy, um, which is how we do it. We recommend that so it's all in one document. Um, so it's just more efficient that way. But the healthcare proxy and the living will both have to be witnessed by two disinterested witnesses. So that you can do on your own, but you have to make sure the witnesses are not the person that you're appointing. Um, it has to be someone else uh, who's not the agent that you're appointing. So what happens if you don't have any of these documents in advance? Um, so there is some uh, safeguards there. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the Family Health Care Decisions Act was passed in New York, and this only applies specifically to patients in the hospital or a nursing home. And it's a situation where the patient doesn't have capacity uh, anymore, but they don't have a health care proxy. So in that case, the law allows someone else to make the decisions for you. That person's called a surrogate and it goes in order of priority who can make the decisions for you. So if there has been a court appointed guardian, they would have priority. Uh, but if there isn't, it would be your spouse. If no spouse, then your adult child. And if not, then your parent. And then it goes down the list to a few other family members. Uh, so, so that is a good um, you know, security to know that there is a backup there, that if you don't have a healthcare proxy, that someone can make decisions for you. Um, but remember, this is only for a setting in a hospital or a nursing home. It doesn't apply once you're out um, of that facility. And of course, it's always better to have this um, done in writing in advance, if you can get it done ahead of time. So now that you've done these advanced directives, right? Let's say you have them all done and signed. Um, who has copies of them? Uh, so you should have copies yourself in your house. Um, you should give copies to your family members. Um, I strongly suggest that because they're going to need it when it's an emergency. So they should have it so they can take it and then go do what they need to do. Um, your medical, like your healthcare proxy, your living will, that should be included in your medical records. So you should bring it to your primary care doctor so they can put it in your records. Any specialist you go see, it can be included in their records. Um, other people do um, uh, all kinds of things of where to store safe records at home. I've had many clients put things in the freezer. Um, some clients drive around with it in their car, in their um, glove compartment, um, you know, in their purse. So, you know, there's lots of different ways to make sure you have it around. Um, a newer way to do it is to put it online in the cloud. Um, there's resources such as Dropbox 
Um, there's other things like Dropbox, which is where you're allowed to store documents in a you know, safe place on the cloud, and you can give anyone access to it. And personally, I use that myself, and it worked really well uh, when my husband and I were taking care of his father. And so we had, he, didn't, he lived in a different state than us, and another relative lived in another state. So I scanned and put his power of attorney and healthcare proxy um, in Dropbox. So anytime someone was called or we had to handle something for him, we could go into Dropbox and we could get that document. Um, and we could show it to, you know, whoever we needed to show it to, uh, to show that we had the authority to talk for him. So that, that can work out uh, pretty well. Uh, there's another company called Everplans, which is similar, where they store all your documents and other information, and then you can get access to anyone that you choose to. So after you have your advanced directives or you've thought about that and considered that, the next thing to talk about is, uh, do you have a will? So that's next on your checklist. And odds are you probably don't if you look at this. Approximately 55% of adult Americans do not have a will. You know, there's many, many reasons for that. People um, don't think they need it. They, they don't think they're going to die. They don't think they're sick, right? They haven't gotten around to it. Lots of reasons to put off doing a will, right? It's not um, exactly top of most people's list. But it's something that when we're going through the checklist, it's something you should think about and something that uh, you should have, and we'll talk about why. So one reason um, to have a will is to think about what happens if you die without a will. If you die without a will, the laws of New York are going to govern who inherits your property. They're called the intestacy laws. And so if you die without a will and you're married and you have children, $50,000 and half of your estate goes to your spouse, and then the other half of your estate goes to your children. So normally that's not what most people's plan are. You know, most wills that we do say everything goes to my spouse and the balance to my children. Um, but if you didn't have a will, this, this rule would take over. And so if you're the surviving spouse and you're counting on all the assets um, to live on, half of them are going to your kids, right? Now, hopefully your kids would realize that this was not what was intended. They would help you out. They could give the money back to you, or maybe not. So the only way to be certain is to get a will done and say exactly how you want that assets, uh, those assets to go. Um, if you don't have a spouse or kids, there's a whole pecking order of other family members who could in inherit if you don't have a will, you know, out to uh, down to first cousins. Um, so there could be many relatives, there could be relatives you don't even speak to um, who could inherit property if you don't have a will. So if you don't have uh, immediate family members, but you don't want those distant family members uh, to inherit, you need to do a will. You could think about, you know, maybe charities or other people that you want to benefit. Um, that is not what would happen if you died without a will. So when you're doing a will, again, this has to be done when you have capacity. It's called testamentary capacity. Um, if you have a power of attorney, your power of attorney can't sign the will for you. It's only something that you can sign yourself. Um, so because you need to have capacity, again, this has to be done in advance. Uh, I have done several will signings where I've gone to a hospital or a nursing home where someone's pretty sick and we have them sign the will and you know sometimes they can sometimes they're not able to and we can't do it uh the capacity to sign the will is that uh, you know what your assets are you know who is entitled to receive your assets you know is, and you understand you know the, the plan that you're creating who is going to receive your assets when you die uh, so and you have to sign the will in front of two adult disinterested witnesses. And so that the reason for that is if there's ever a question as to whether you have capacity to sign the will or not, those two witnesses are gonna testify in the future in a court 
um, as to your capacity when you sign the will. So the witnesses have to be disinterested. Of course, they can't be anyone who's named in the will. You can't be a witness if you're receiving something in the will. Uh, the affidavit of subscribing witnesses just want those two witnesses signed that say that you were, you know, of sound mind, you know, you weren't under duress, no one was influencing you uh, when you signed the will. Another common thing that happens is someone does a will, but they want to make changes to it, but they don't come back to the lawyer who did the will. And so you can't make handwritten changes or additions to your will. Um, and this happened recently where someone had passed away and on their will they had uh, written things in. They have, you know, crossed out some bequests or changed the amount or the name of the person that was going to. And unfortunately that is invalid um, because the court isn't going to know whether that was the part, you know, you who made the changes or was it someone else who made those changes to the will. So if you want to make changes to the will, you need to go back to your lawyer and have the will updated, um, again, with the two witnesses. Now there's many, many types of property that pass without a will. So when you're doing your checklist, you're going to go through and make a list of all of your assets. And as you go through the list of assets, you're going to see some of them uh, have beneficiaries or may pass to other people. Uh, so first of all, any joint bank accounts that you have, they're going to go to the joint owner. Uh, and these, so this is all regardless of what your will says. Your life insurance, that's going to go to whoever you named as your beneficiary. Uh, same thing with retirement plans. There are accounts called transfer on death accounts, so TOD accounts. And that can be on a bank account, it can be on an investment account. And what that means is you're naming a beneficiary on the bank account, just like your life insurance or your retirement plan. Uh, so that person will uh, be able to access the account after your death. Uh, real estate. So if you own real estate jointly with someone, it is going, well, depending on how it's worded, it can pass to the survivor. So if you're married and you own uh, real property together, uh, that when the first spouse dies, that's going to go to the surviving spouse. If you're not married, then you own real estate jointly with someone else. Um, so this happens uh, frequently. Let's say there's like a, a camp property or some other property that parents leave to their children, and now they all own it together. If you own it as joint tenants with right of survivorship, what that means is that when one person passes away, the survivors own it. If you own it as tenants in common, then that means you each own your share separately. So let's say we have four siblings owning the property and one of them dies. Now their kids own the property with the other three siblings. And you know, so it's a separate interest. So you got to pass that down however you want. So it's uh, important to look at you know, real estate, especially, but all these other things to see how title is held. Uh, see if you've named a beneficiary on the account. Um, check who the beneficiaries are. Are they outdated? Is it someone that you want to change who the beneficiary is? I've had people come in with uh, life insurance that names their parents and, you know, they're the parents are long gone, right? So it was life insurance they had from when they were young and they just never updated the beneficiary. So it is important to double check these things as part of this list, as part of everything uh, that you're doing. So another thing to think about when you're going through your checklist is, do you need a trust? Um, so trust can be valuable for certain people in certain circumstances. Um, so trusts do a couple of things. They keep your um, affairs private, they avoid probate, and they can protect your assets. So trusts avoid probate uh, because whatever you have in the trust uh, and you name a trustee, it's going to go directly to your beneficiaries on your death and bypass probate. 
And so we'll talk a little bit about that next. So there are two types of trusts. There's revocable trusts and irrevocable trusts. So a, revoc a revocable trust is a trust that you're in control. You're your own trustee. So you manage the trust. You can amend the trust. You can put property in and out of the trust. And the main reason people do that is to avoid probate on your debt. And there was a question about probate, so we can talk about this a little bit. So, you know, what is probate? So probate is um, the process of getting appointed as an ex executor. So you have a will, right? You sign your will, you'll put, you name an executor in your will. Um, now when you pass away, that executor needs to step up and take over and start handling things. But they can't do that just because you name them in the will. The will has to be filed with the court along with the probate petition. Um, the court has to review it. Everyone who um, is named in the will receives a notice. You know, people have a chance to contest the will. You know, nine times out of 10, no one does. And then the judge approves it and appoints the person named as the executor. So that's the court process that happens. And the executor is the person who starts that process. When you have a trust, you don't need to go through that process uh, because the trustee of the trust is going to now take over upon your death and distribute those assets and they don't need to have that court approval. When you're in the probate process, uh, the estate has to stay open for many months. That's to give creditors time to file any claims, gives you time to pay off any bills or expenses. Uh, you have to report back to the court on what you did with all the money and how you distributed it. Um, when you have a trust, there is no reporting uh, to the court. You know, there's no oversight like that. Uh, you, you do report to the other beneficiaries informally, um, but it's not as formal um, as a court process. Uh, the estate has to be open for at least seven months to allow creditors uh, to file their claims. Um, but oftentimes, a, a, an estate uh, is open for about a year or so. It, it's uh, usually a long process. The other type of trust uh, that you can establish is an irrevocable trust. Now, an irrevocable trust avoids probate just like the revocable trust. Um, there's a trustee. However, you're not your own trustee. You have to appoint someone else to be the trustee. Um, so that means you're giving up some control. What you're training for in control is the protection of the assets for Medicaid purposes. So whatever you put into the irrevocable trust will be protected down the road if you need to apply it for Medicaid. So that's the main difference between the two types of trusts. And so it's something that you should look at, consider in your checklist, right? Do you need a trust? And, um, you know, which type of trust is going to be right for you? So going down your checklist, uh, next you should think about how do I plan for long-term care? And, you know, whether it's for you, yourself, or for your parents, or your family, older family members, um, is this is something that you should have a discussion with them about, you know, have they thought about this? And these are some of the questions to talk about to open the discussion about planning for long term care. Um, where do you want to receive your services? Uh, when I do the seminar live, I always ask who wants to go to a nursing home. And no one raises their hand because no one wants to be in a nursing home. Most people want to stay home. Um, so that is something to think about. Where do you want to be? Uh, the next thing to think about is how much will it cost? And then, of course, how will you pay for your care based on how much it costs? So where do you want to be? Um, these are uh, your options, basically. You know, first is to stay at home. Many, many people want to stay at home, and many people are able to do so. Um, so things to think about is, is your current home set up 
so that you could stay there? You know, is it one story? Is it, are you able to go around there easily? Or do you want to stay at home, but you may have to downsize and move to a different home? Another middle option is assisted living. So assisted living is going to be where you have your own apartment, so it's private, um, but you're going to have your meals together with other people. There'll be activities together and there'll be extra services, you know, someone to kind of check in on you all the time. And then last is a nursing home, which I'm sure that's not where anyone wants to be, um, but sometimes people do have to end up there based on, you know, their medical conditions and their physical care. So how much are all these services going to cost? So home care um, can be cheap, right? It, it can be free. Uh, you know, this is the next question I ask is how many people think their kids are going to take care of them for free? Um, not necessarily, right? Sometimes your kids just don't want to, sometimes your kids want to, but they have to work full time. So you can't always count on free care from family members. Um, so you may have to pay for a home health aid uh, to come into your house to take care of you. Uh, home health aid is going to cost about $30 through an agency. Um, a little bit less if you go off the books. Um, costs for assisted living vary greatly from, you know, three to six thousand dollars per month is kind of the average I've seen for assisted livings in the area. If you are going to a memory care, uh, that's just assisted living um, with enhanced, uh, you know, security and other supervision for people with dementia that can cost up to $10,000 per month. And if you do have to go to a nursing home, that's going to cost up to $15,000 a month. So at least you need to know what the numbers are so you can kind of think about how would you pay for it and just start that conversation. So what are the sources of payment for long-term care? Um, there's Medicare. Medicare only provides limited coverage. So if you're in a hospital and then you go into a nursing home for rehab, Medicare is only going to cover the first 100 days, okay? So they're not going to cover more than three months. So, so Medicare is not going to cover the majority of your cost. Um, there's paying privately, right, out of your own pocket. Um, What's your income? What's your assets? How long could you pay for care in each of those different situations? There's long-term care insurance um, that could pay all or a good portion of these costs. Um, but is it something that you qualify for or are the premiums something that you could afford? And then the last is Medicaid. So Medicaid is the government program where there's um, income and asset tests. And once you meet those income and asset tests, Medicaid will then pay for your nursing home care or your care at home. Um, so do you, are you eligible for Medicaid or could you be eligible for Medicaid if you plan ahead? Uh, these are some questions to think about and to talk about with your family. So paying for long-term care. Um, so I just said, have you discussed your plans with your family? Again, it's something that's good to open the conversation with, right? Just like doing your will, no one wants to talk about long-term care. Um, but it's better to kind of talk about it when it's not an emergency. Plan a little bit in advance so you kind of have an idea of what uh, the plans are going to be in the future. Um, does your family know what your income and assets are? Many times adult children aren't always aware of what their parents' income or assets are. So if they're talking about this, you know, you kind of need to have everything on the table so you can all um, think together about how to plan for these things. You know, do you have long-term care insurance? If you do, look at the policy, see what it covers, become familiar with it. Um, have you considered an irrevocable trust to protect your assets? So that's something to think about ahead of time to protect the assets so you could qualify for Medicaid. So these are good things to have um, on your checklist and to discuss with your family. So an irrevocable trust 
um, protects your assets in case you need to apply for Medicaid in the future. And these have to be done in advance. There's a look back period for Medicaid, um, which so currently for nursing homes, it's five years, the look back. So what does that mean? That means that you would have to have set up a trust five years before you go into a nursing home in order for the assets to be protected. So you're really thinking ahead in terms of that kind of a time frame. It's not something you can leave uh, to the last minute to do. Currently, there's no look back for community Medicaid. So community Medicaid is a program that pays for you to receive care at home, um, where home health aides come into your house. So that you don't have to start five years in advance. Um, you could, under current rules, and just keep that in mind for a second, you could set up a trust now and you could be eligible for community Medicaid next month. So, but however, that is changing in the future. Uh, there's been a change to the Medicaid rules this year and beginning on October 1st of this year, community Medicaid will have a 30 month look back period. So that's two and a half years. So if you're thinking about planning ahead and doing a trust, you know, for community Medicaid that you, where you may need home care, um, it would be good to get it done before this look back period starts. Uh, so otherwise you're going to have to have done it two and a half years before you need the care. And these are, these are just kind of, this is kind of just a checklist, a brief overview of items. Uh, we, we've had other webinars where we talk more extensively about qualifying for Medicaid and community Medicaid um, and what these new Medicaid rules uh, mean. So you can listen to one of those webinars to get more information about this. So Medicaid planning. So there's a couple of things you can do to plan ahead to qualify for Medicaid. So of course, we were just talking about trusts where you can create a trust in advance. You can use exempt transfers or spend downs to reduce your assets. Um, so again, this is just a brief overview of the Medicaid rules, but for Medicaid, uh, you can only have around $15,000 in your own name to apply for Medicaid. Uh, there's some transfers that are exempt. There's some assets that are exempt that aren't gonna count towards that, mainly your retirement plans. And you could also just spend down your money. By spending it down, I mean spending it on things that you need, purchasing things for yourself or for your house or a car. Uh, gifting money away, is not, you can't gift money away um, because that would count against you for Medicaid. Um, there's crisis planning. So this is for all those people who haven't planned in advance, okay? And now they suddenly need uh, to pay for a nursing home. And this one's really important. You can still do something at the last minute where you can save about half of your assets. Um, it's, it's a plan using a gift and a promissory note. Um, and the situation where we, you would use it is let's say you haven't done any planning um, and unfortunately you know, maybe you fall or you, you know, need to go to a nursing home for rehab and then it turns out whatever due to your health conditions you're going to have to stay there. Well, now the nursing home is going to ask you to start paying privately, right? And they're not going to tell you that you can do anything to save your money. They're just going to say, keep paying the nursing home until you've spent all your money. And once you get down to $15,000, we'll do the Medicaid application for you. So we'll help you out. Well, that's fine, except that you're going to spend all your money on the nursing home. If instead, at that point, you consult with an elder law attorney, you can probably save about half of your assets so you don't have to spend them all down um, to become eligible for Medicaid. So there is something that you can do at the last minute. Another tool that you can use is spousal refusal. Um, that's if you're married and then you put all of your assets in your spouse's name. And if now your spouse is allowed to have about $74,000 of assets and you can still qualify for Medicaid. 
However, if your spouse has more than that, they can do a spousal refusal, um, which means they refuse to use those assets to pay for your care and you can still get Medicaid. The drawback to that is that the county can then come after you and sue you when you do a spousal refusal. They can sue the spouse with the money. The benefit though is that the spouse could then settle with the county and agree to pay their share of the nursing home costs, um, but you are paying what the county rate is for the nursing home rather than the private pay rate. So it, it's a greatly reduced cost. You know, if a nursing home costs about $15,000 a month, uh, what the county rate is is probably about seven or $8,000 a month. So in certain situations, a spousal refusal uh, could be a good tool to use and it could save you um, a bunch of money. Okay. All right. Um, so there's a question here before we go on to the next one is, what documents do you need to have originals of? Okay. And that's a good question. Um, so when we do our documents for you, we uh, keep all the originals or a full set of the originals in our office. Um, we, we give you, well, we, we have you sign more than one original of, of certain documents. Um, most things that you need to do, you can use a copy for. So your healthcare proxy, I'd say you almost always can use a copy of it. I really haven't had a doctor's office, you know, ask us to provide them with the original copy. Powers of attorney, they're a little bit trickier. You should be able to use a copy, um, but there are times where banks will say that they want to see the original power of attorney. Um, if that's the case, you know, you certainly can do that. Sometimes a bank will say the power of attorney, you know, let's say it was a couple of years ago, uh, they'll want an affidavit um, to say that the power of attorney is still in effect, that it hasn't been revoked. Uh, so powers of attorney can be a little tricky. Um, sometimes we try and get around the uh, requirement that you give an original to the bank by us doing an attorney certified copy, um, which is us saying that this is a true copy of the original and that will often work at the banks. Um, so you shouldn't really have to have originals of anything. Copies should really work most of the time. Okay, so before I go on to the next slide, let's see. Yeah, I have a little bit of time just to talk a little bit more about the gift and promissory note because there was a question about that. Um, and it's, it, it's a rather complicated process, um, but to give you the, you know, the overhead view of it, what you're going to do is, let's say you have $100,000, right? You're gonna gift, half of that, $50,000. Now, whenever you gift money and you apply for Medicaid, uh, there's a penalty period associated with that. So that gift of $50,000 is going to create a penalty period of, let's say about five months. So what that means is for the first five months after you've applied for Medicaid, you're not going to be eligible for Medicaid because of that gift. So you're in the nursing home, you've applied for Medicaid, and now you have a five month penalty period. So that's when the promissory note comes into play. With the other $50,000 that you have, you're going to give it to you know, one of your kids or a family member, and they're going to sign a promissory note. So they're gonna pay you back $10,000 a month, which is gonna be used to pay the nursing home during the penalty period. So you have split your money in two, right? You have half of the money being used to pay the nursing home. And the other half is a gift, which is gonna, at the end of the five months, your um, children are gonna be able to keep that gift. And then Medicaid will start paying for the nursing home. So that's kind of the, you know, the 10,000 foot view of that plan. There's a few factors that go into it, you know, basically looking at your assets and your income and the cost of the nursing home. Um, but that's kind of generally the plan that we want to end up saving you about half of your money. 
Okay, so a um, little bit here at the end, I'm gonna talk about retirement planning. Um, so there were some big changes in 2020 to uh, retirement plans uh, that you should know about. And of course, when you're going through a checklist, your retirement plan is a big part of your planning. So you need to know what the rules are that keep changing on this. So the first change that happened is the starting date for RMDs. And RMDs are required minimum distributions. Those are the, the amounts that you have to start taking out from your IRA or your 401k. And at used to be age 70 and a half, now it's age 72. So they've delayed it a little bit. So when you reach age 72, you have to start taking money out of your retirement plan if you haven't done so already. Uh, another rule that changed with the SECURE Act this year, and this is a big one for beneficiaries. So before this rule, when you left your IRA to your beneficiaries, uh, let's say I have my IRA and I left it, I have two sons, I left it to them. Um, they would, in, in the past, whenever they inherited the IRA from me, they wouldn't have to take the money out right away. They could stretch those payments out over their lifetime. So that's extending it a long time. And while, during, while you've extended it, that money is growing tax-free in that account. You do have to pay taxes when you take money out, um, but not while it's earning it in the account. Well, that rule changed this year and it said that you can't defer it for lifetime anymore when you inherit it. Now you have to take that money out over 10 years. Um, so the tax deferral is not going to be as long as it used to be. There's only a 10 year time frame to stretch out those deferrals. Another change that happened uh, this year is that if you're still working, as many people are, you know, into their 60s and 70s, um, you can still contribute to your IRA. Um, there used to be a cutoff at age 70 and a half when you couldn't contribute to your IRAs anymore. And there was also some, uh, in terms of your retirement plans, some laws that uh, were passed to provide relief because of COVID this year. Um, and this was part of the CARES Act that was passed um, because many people's retirement plans, I mean, gosh, you're probably afraid to look at it, right? It's, they've gone down significantly in value or they've gone down and come up and gone down again like most people's have. Um, so there's a couple different things you can do. Um, so one thing is if your retirement um, account is decreased in value, so you don't really want to touch it, right, because it's gone so low, you can waive um, the, I mean, the IRS waived your RMDs for 2020. So you can skip taking a distribution this year if you want to, um, to let your account kind of build back up in value. Um, Two other things that happen in regards to retirement plans, uh, accounts, and this is to help people out who are having financial difficulties because of COVID. Um, so the first one is that you can borrow up to $100,000 from your retirement plan, and uh, the loan payments are gonna be deferred through the end of the year. So that's really meant to kind of get you through the end of the year, get you through a crisis. Um, alternatively, you can withdraw up to $100,000 from your retirement plan without a penalty. So normally if you're under 59 and a half and you take any money out of your retirement plan, you have to pay a 10% penalty. Uh, so the IRS is waiving that penalty. Um, the other thing they're doing is, of course, anytime you withdraw money from a retirement plan, you have to pay income taxes. So they are deferring any income taxes on that withdrawal for up to three years. Um, so they're pushing that tax off to the future. So these are just important things to know as for many people, your retirement plan is probably one of your biggest assets and it's something that you really need to, uh, to look at and to manage as best you can. All right, so I'm just gonna go briefly back over the checklist. Um, so these are things you should do. So do you have an emergency plan in place? Who can talk, who, um, who should be contacted, right? Um, how can people get your information? 
How can I get access to it? Um, do you have advanced directives in place so someone could take care of things if you were incapacitated? Um, do you have a will or a trust? Um, they're important, as we saw, uh, to avoid the intestacy laws and to make sure your property goes to who you want it to go to. Um, does your family know where your documents are? Do they have a copy of them? Um, have you discussed your long-term care wishes with your family? It's always good to do that in advance. Um, does your family know your financial assets? And there's you know, many different ways to organize your information. You can get organizers online. I know at our firm in the past, at our client seminars, we've given out an organizer. They're great to have. Um, so there's a list of everything that your family uh, should know in the event of an emergency. Um, and have you reviewed your retirement accounts in terms of who your beneficiaries are? Um, if you're at the age where you're taking distributions, have you reviewed properly all your options um, in regards to that? Okay, and we are at the end here. So um, I'm gonna open it up for questions at this point. I think I saw a question pop up before, let me check. Um, oh, how can we access this presentation? Um, so after today, I, uh, you know, probably tomorrow or by the end of the week, uh, we'll have this presentation up on our website um, where you can access it. Or if you actually want um, a copy of the slides, you can email us and we can send you a copy of them afterwards. Let's see, another question. Okay. All right. So. Again, thank you all for coming. If you want any more information or you have any more questions um, that are specific to you, you can set up a free consultation with me or any of the other attorneys at the firm um, by calling us or emailing us. Uh, another way you can find out more information is to listen to us on the radio. Um, we have a radio show every Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. It's on Magic 590 or 100.5, and we take questions on there, and we talk about uh, the same types of issues, long-term care, elder care, and estate planning. Okay. All right. So I don't see any more questions coming in, so thank you for listening, and have a great day. <laughs>